Good evening and welcome to the sermon for Sunday the 22nd of August 2021. My name is Michelle and as always it's a great privilege to listen, to reflect and to unpack something of God's word. Not only intellectually understanding but to see how it applies in your and my lives. Forgive the informality of my dress. I'm recording this quite late on Saturday night due to various unforeseen reasons. But I know that God can use anything at any stage. And so together may we avail ourselves of the blessing of being together in this way. Let us pray. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our Rock and our Redeemer. Amen. I wonder if any of you have ever found yourself thinking that some of Jesus' teachings are really hard, impossible in fact. Well, you'll be relieved to know you're not the only ones. Even some of the crowds of disciples who followed Jesus when he was in the flesh on earth found some of his teaching really difficult. Like this morning's teaching about eating and drinking his body and blood and about him being the eternal word. However, it does seem to bring out a point, doesn't it? That when we encounter something mysterious or strange or uncomfortable about God, we're challenged. What do we do about this? Do we like so many disciples, those disciples men mentioned in John chapter 6 verse 66, they turn away and they reject Jesus? Or do we stay faithful even when God's ways make no sense to us? Just as an aside, which is rather a lovely acronym for the word faith, forsaking all I trust in him. And this acronym, this, this simple phrase comes up in our understanding for today's gospel reading that we've already started to look at. Now, truth be told, most of us spend a lot of our lives seesawing between trusting and not trusting God. But hopefully we still choose to follow our Lord Jesus no matter what state our faith is in. It's so interesting to note how both the story about God's gift of manna to feed the Israelites in the wilderness that Jesus refers to in our John Gospel reading. So that story and God's gift of Jesus in the flesh as a mystical form of nourishment to us of his body and blood, those two stories form part of an ongoing and consistent provision by God to us. Throughout this world's God story over millions of years, there is this verifiable golden thread of God's supernatural provision and yet time and again the recipients thereof, including Jesus' disciples, grumble and complain. Actually, God is pretty good at handling the grumbling and complaining. The problem is in what it represents, namely a lack of trust in God. In John chapter 6, verse 34, we read the phrase, Some of you do not believe. Now, the original Greek word that is used there, which we have translated as believe, that Greek word is pisteo. And pisteo, more accurately understood, means to trust, to rely on someone. So, a more accurate reading of that phrase would be, some of you do not trust God. I wonder how this lack of trust 
in God's provision is perhaps holding up a mirror to our own lives personally, communally, globally. In our lives, each of us has repeatedly borne witness to miracles of God's provision and what amazing stories we could all share around this. So, what is stopping us from trusting God now? As all of humanity and God's church embarks on a fresh evolutionary phase with so many changes on all sorts of levels. Surely, just as Jesus was God's perfect provision for our salvation over 2,000 years ago, Jesus still remains God's perfect provision for our salvation now during this frighteningly uncertain time in all of our lives. But the question remains, do you and I trust and rely utterly on God? If Jesus' words about us needing to eat his body and blood are about God's provision of eternal spiritual nourishment and not a form of cannibalism, as so many obviously seem to think, but if it is about this, this eternal spiritual nourishment, why did so many of his disciples get so antsy about this and literally turn their backs on Jesus. And in order to answer that question, we would need to go back to Leviticus. Leviticus chapter 17, verses 10 to 14. When we read this, we will discover that there is a very serious and heavy-duty law about how God's people were to handle blood. We're told unequivocally, you do not eat blood. End of discussion. This divine commandment was deeply ingrained in the da daily life of the Israelites and in fact is still part of the slaughterhouses which produce kosher meat. So when Jesus says that in order to inherit eternal life we must drink his blood, this is highly incendiary language even blasphemous, and the breaking of one of God's millennia-old commandments. Even the disciples who didn't walk away, who stayed, even they did a double take and were very puzzled and confused. For them, for the Jews, blood was forbidden territory, not because it was unclean, but because it was holy. For the Jew, the life force of a creature is in its blood. And since God is the creator and the giver of this life force, then there is something of God in blood, which is what makes it sacred. And this automatically means that life is sacred. It belongs to God and God alone. We can begin to see then why when Jesus tells his followers to drink his blood, why it's so shocking and anti-God to so many of them. And yet, as Jesus did with so many of the old Jewish laws in the power of the Holy Spirit, he reinterprets and gives a fresh understanding to an old commandment. What he is saying by entreating us to drink his blood is come, take my life and pour it into your bodies, your lives, your souls. This, this is what makes us recipients of eternal life, that Christ abides in us and we abide in him. So in conclusion, not only do we receive God's provision of eternal life? But we are also conduits of the possibility of eternal life for others. After all, remember, the only Bible some people may read is your and my life. And the only form of Jesus some people may encounter is you.